And our speaker is Rodrigo Romo. He's Program Director at Pacific International Space Center for Exploration Systems. And he's gonna talk about analog test sites for lunar surface operations. So aloha everybody from uh, Hilo, Hawaii. I'm gonna to try to go through the slides um, relatively fast so we can have more time at the end to, to discuss and talk about analog test sites in Hawaii. Um, Pisces, uh, we're a state agency. We fall under the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism. We are located in Hawaii, a um, big island uh, in the city of Hilo. Uh, our main objective as per legislators is to promote the aerospace industry in the state and to promote economic uh, development and economic diversification. Um, we do that through various ways. We do uh, applied research and dual technology. Our focus has been on ISRU. If you saw Kyla's talk yesterday, you can see the work we've been doing on basalt characterization and the effects that mineral variation have on, on centerability of the basalt. Uh, we also get engaged in long-term economic development projects. Uh, we do a lot of outreach and workforce development. The island of Hawaii uh, is formed by five main volcanoes, uh, two of which are still considered active. Uh, there is uh, the Kohala, the Walalai, Mauna Kea, Mauna Loa, and Kilauea, of which Mauna Loa and Kilauea are still considered active. So that gives us plenty of uh, basalt-based fields uh, of, of wide characteristics. We have pristine lava fields with no significant vegetation growing on them. Uh, there are multiple lava tubes throughout the island. Uh, some have been developed and open for tourism. Others are remote areas, but they, they, they range in, in size and in elevation. Uh, that's another advantage we have on the big island. You can go from surfing in the, mo in the morning to snowboarding in the afternoon uh, with no problem. Uh, Mount Akea has uh, an elevation of 4,200 meters above sea level. So we get all types of weather. We got two major airports, uh, Kona and Hilo. We have a deep sea water port. And on the Hilo side, we have a university and a community college. So we got all the ideal infrastructure for, for testing. Uh, some of the pictures on this slide show some of the areas, lava tubes, skylights uh, present on the big island that we have explored and looked at as at possible analog sites. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about the Big Island is uh, characteristics of basalt are somewhat similar in, in composition to lunar regolith or to Mars regolith. Uh, you can see in this graph, and Kyla spoke a lot more about this yesterday, uh, the top line on this table is the uh, mineral composition of a basalt sample we collected from a commercial quarry here in Hilo. JSC1A is a, a simulant, and the others are uh, analyzed samples from the Moon and Mars. And back in, in 2010, there were some analog field tests done here in Hawaii, uh, where one of the instruments that's mounted on Curiosity was tested here. And some of the first uh, headlines that came back after Curiosity took samples in, in Mars was that Mars was a lot like Hawaii. And that was just because of the similarities found in the, in the samples collected in, in Mars uh, with the samples analyzed here in Hawaii. So we got not only the, the, the geographical uh, aspect, uh, the, the similar uh, characteristics and properties of the terrain, but there's also similarities uh, on the basalt with the regolith that you find on the moon or Mars, which allows us to do uh, testing and experimentation on how to manipulate that as a, source for, for manufacturing. Uh, the Big Island has a long history uh, with analog testing. Back in the early Apollo days, as early as 67, uh, testing was done uh, doing, you know, geology training course were uh, provided here to Apollo uh, crew members. In 69, uh, some of the instrumentation that was taken and tools to the moon that were tested here. Um, geological training in the, in the 70s. So the Big Island has been used for, for many times uh, as an analog lunar site uh, for its characteristics. In modern days under Pisces, we have held uh, quite a number of analog uh, tests uh, and operations. 
uh, you know, uh, a lot of them on ISRU, um, oxygen extraction from regolith, uh, mobility testing, uh, tires testings. We did some uh, dust removal uh, prevention testing with some high school students here and guys from uh, Swamp Works and Kennedy. So it's been, it's been regularly used uh, for multiple analog field tests here in Hawaii. I'm gonna go over three of the sites that, that are uh, most commonly used uh, or, or most readily available for testing, I would say. And that is uh, Haiwahina Valley, which is on the slopes of Mauna Kea. Uh, then there's a high seas uh, lunar Mars uh, habitat. And I must uh, make clear that high seas and Pisces are two separate and independent organizations. Uh, we do have close relationships with Hyces. Um, Hank Rogers, who, who is now, who owns the, the habitat and is in charge of running the, the simulations taking place there, is also on my board of directors. So we have a close collaboration with Hyces. So if there was any interest in, in doing any testing at Hyces, uh, Pisces can get involved and, and help uh, uh, get set things up. And then the latest one that we found recently is located on the Kona side and it's NELHA. That's a National uh, Natural Energy Lab of Hawaii uh, Authority. And we're gonna go a little bit over the characteristics of each one of those three sites and you know what infrastructure and benefits offer. First, we're gonna go with Pu'uhaiwahine, uh, Pu which is a high elevation site. It's about 9,000 feet above sea level. It's located uh, close to Halepohaku. Halepohaku is a facility that astronomers use uh, on Mauna Kea when they're not up on the telescope at the summit, uh, they stay at Halepohaku and, and they provide full facilities uh, for people to stay there. And those facilities are available for people who want to go do uh, field testing. The Haiwahina Valley is a flat, valley with um, granular sand surface uh, has about 700 feet at the widest and about 2,500 feet at the longest and that's at the flat area of the valley and it's surrounded by slopes of different gradients and different compositions which make it ideal for different mobility types of testing. As you can see in this picture these are some of the, the images from High Wahine. Uh, you can see a tent set up there for the for the field test uh, and, and mission control. Uh, we can do daytime operations, nighttime operations, uh, remote location operations. That picture in the center is a resource prospector team uh, taking our rover for a ride from uh, NASA Ames. So we can provide um, remote links to do remote operations and we have the ability to promote, uh, provide um, time delay to replicate operations as you would have on the moon or Mars. Uh, the, the rover on the two pictures of the right is Helelani. It's a, it's, a, it's a rover that we have at Pisces and that is available as a mobile platform for testing hardware instrumentation, imaging systems, telemetry, sensors, uh, any type of platform that would require uh, a mobile platform to, to be tested, uh, the rover is available for it. Some of the tests that we have done uh, with our rover, you know, include uh, navigation tests, distance, you can see the change in elevation. Uh, this is the type of, of operations uh, we can do with the rover at the High Wahina Valley. As far as Halepohaku goes, as I say, it provides full operation. It's got a full cafeteria. Uh, so the, there is a fee to stay at Halepohaku, but the, the fee includes uh, three meals per day, a uh, room with private bathroom, each bathroom, there's conference rooms, there's a recreation area, and it's just a uh, stone throw away from the High Wahina uh, uh, Valley. So it makes ideal for, for operations and, and lodging for that test. <clears throat> the next site is one that we just recently came across, and it's, uh, it's at Nelha. Uh, it's located right next to the Kona Airport. Uh, one of the, one of the, uh, I forgot to say that, one of the issues with, um, with Haiwahine is that it is located on DLNR land. Uh, so it, it, uh, DLNR permit is required and so that needs to be, um, 
procured we would sometime in advance and there is a risk of some dates being uh, blocked out due to, to uh, invasive species control. There is a paved road that goes all the way to Halapahaku with easy access, but to get from Halapahaku into the, into the valley, uh, it's, it's a four wheel drive unmaintained road. And as you can see from that picture, there is a, um, an access road that goes on from the top of the picture and then an uh, exit road that goes from the bottom. Those two roads are, are four wheel drive. Uh, there are no bathrooms or water in the valley uh, itself, but there's all facilities at Halapahaku, bathroom, water, uh, communications, electricity, uh, high-speed internet. Uh, Nelha site, uh, there's, there's, it's, it's under Nelha authority, so there is no permit requirements. Uh, it's not on the DLNR, so we can get easy access to that site. Uh, there's paved road and there it is a uh, gated site, so there's security at night. There are communications and high-speed high internet available at the location. Uh, it's, it is at, high, at sea level, so it is hot, whereas High Wahina can get pretty cold. High Wahina does get frost in the winter months, not snow, but it does get frost on the ground. Nelha is hot year-round, but it's on the dry side of the island, so there's very low probability of precipitation. It's a good lunar analog site, uh, primarily a flat surface with sanded terrain and some lava outcrops. And it's a good site for uh, surface mobility tests. These are some images of, of the site. Uh, as you can see, it is a very lunar-like terrain with large rocks interdispersed throughout the, the sand field. There are some lava outcrops throughout, it, throughout uh, the site. The, the main flat area, actually it extends about twice as that, so it's about 250 meters long by about 70 meters at, at its widest. Um, and even though you are right next to the ocean, it's in a, some somewhat of a depression. So if you're standing on the on the test area, you can't see the ocean. Um, it's a really uh, neat location that we just uh, discovered recently, and we're we're planning on doing a an international robotic mining competition at this location based on uh, NASA's uh, Lunabotics event uh, for universities. At Nelha, there is a building where with all the facilities available, there is communication. There is not a link from this building to the analog test site, but it's about one mile as a crow flies from with line of sight from this facility to the test site. So it's easy to set up a, a wireless link from this location to the test site. This, this facility does have high-speed internet, uh, conference rooms, cafeteria, uh, bathrooms, and, and it all can be used for, for testing. And last but not least, uh, the high seas uh, habitat, uh, you know, it provides various types of, of lava terrains, uh, access to walking distance, large size lava tubes, and this facility could be used as a um, lunar simulation habitat uh, with, with the facilities included, or it can be used as a, um, a ground base to do a robotic or other type of operations at that location. What we can support as far as capabilities goes, uh, you know, we have the infrastructure required for deployment at a test site, tents, chairs, tables, generators, power, hardware, local communication network, remote communication links. Uh, we have the analog rover also available for, for testing. We provide all the, the permit requisitions, reservations. We have a high bay with, with a shop uh, in it. We can uh, get interns and volunteers to help with the test sites. We have a secure trailer that can be used to transport all the equipment to the, to the test locations. We can help uh, with third-party equipment rentals if, if required, and we can set, uh, you know, control room operations for any test. And then with regards to our, our, our analog rover, uh, it has an open payload deck design, which allows for the uh, integration of various types of payloads. Uh, here are some examples of the work that we have done with it. We did a uh, a landing pad construction project together with uh, Swamp Works at Kennedy and Honeybee Robotics, where we tested some um, basalt sintered pavers as, as a landing pad material. 
Uh, it has got a, uh, it can be either uh, remotely controlled by, by hand or through a graphic user interface remotely. It can carry up to 200 pounds of payload uh, with no problem and up to 100 pounds on the, on the mast. We have three situational cameras, GPS, IMU. We have access to 12, 24, and 48 volts DC on the rover. So you can uh, adapt any, any type of instrumentation or sensor uh, that goes with it. We have a, a, an IDC document that we can provide upon request that shows all the capabilities uh, on the rover that are available. And also is, is the only uh, member of the Pisces staff that is a TV star. It was featured at the uh, Hawaii Five-O episode in one season, and it's been in other uh, documentaries and and um, and TV shows. And um, also, that's an example of, of the of the robotic arm in operation. It's a time lapse time lapse uh, video. This was actually uh, the arm was being controlled and operated by engineers at SwarmWorks out of Kennedy Space Center. So, you know, that's, that's kind of a, one of the examples of, of the work that has been done uh, with a rover. And with that, I would like to uh, thank everybody uh, who's here and uh, open the room for any questions uh, people might have. Thanks, Rodrigo. That was really interesting. Let's, uh, let's get to some questions. Philip Kroom asks, is the regolith a chemical or mechanical simulant? It's more of a uh, chemical uh, than mechanical. Uh, as, as you know, you've seen in several of the talks here, uh, getting the right edges and, and, and grain shapes for lunar analogs is, is not as simple. Um, it, it does have some, some erosion and, and weathering. Uh, so it's more of a, of a mineralogy uh, simulant, although we, we do have some very fine grain uh, basalt that we can get uh, that, that could get close, but not, not as close as some of the, the specially made uh, simulants. Okay, Philip had a, another question. Uh, is it possible to set up a simulation facility for a vertically integrated lunar manufacturing facility? Uh, well, uh, I guess we, we would have to, and I'll put my email here. Uh, I mean, some of these questions may not be as easy to answer just now. It really depends on, on what you need uh, on, the, on the vertically integrated uh, facility. Um, one thing that I can, I, I can say is uh, Hank Rogers is looking at, at building a campus uh, here on the Big Island to do a, um, a full-scale lunar, uh, lunar base. So that might fall better within, uh, or that, that, that project might fall better within that, that project. Uh, so, I mean, I'm sorry for the ambiguous answer, but it's something we would probably have to, to discuss offline and find out exactly what is it that, that you mean by it and what, what requirements you would have, and then we can see what can be done. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Phil Huter asks, can you tell us more about the lava tubes? Okay, so like I said, we, we're made out of five volcanoes. So there's lava tubes galore. Um, actually, a lot of people buy land and when they're clearing the land, their they're, they're D9s or the D10s crash through the, you know, sealing the lava tube down into the ground. Uh, some are lower elevations, which have been um, affected by, by vegetations. Other are at higher elevations. Some are, are on private property, so it's just a matter of talking to the, to the landowner to get access to it. Uh, the ones that are on public land, it's, it's delicate. It's, uh, it's hard to, to get permits to do permanent um, alterations, such as drilling. On, on lava tubes. But again, it's something that we can talk about offline and find out more about the specifics. Uh, we actually submitted a proposal uh, once uh, with Astrobotic, which was to design uh, an autonomous uh, drone to fly into 
into lava tubes and collect small drill samples. And they were talking about extremely small drilling samples, so that was not going to be a problem getting a permit for it. So again, uh, we can go offline and talk more about the, the, the specifications for your testing requirements and determine, you know, whether it's doable or not and or which lava tube to, to try to go after. Okay. Uh... Julio Resende asks, how do you apply to be a volunteer? Well, uh, to be a, a, a strict volunteer, that's an unpaid, uh, just reach out to us by email and uh, usually we, we do internship or volunteer uh, projects during the summertime, except, you know, this year, since we're all here in, in Zoom, that, that tells you that our internship project this this summer did not happen. Uh, some, some years we do have funds for paid interns, but because we're a state agency, we give priority to local students from local universities or students from Hawaii that return to the island during the summer break. Uh, but again, if it's, if it's a project that can be done uh, remotely, just contact us by email and, and we'll work uh, on the details and see if it's something that can be done. Cool. Uh, Frederick Kilner <laughs> likes to know, are there self-diagnostic microphones so software could detect if a gear or bearing or some other mechanical component was starting to have an issue in a rover? Microphones? Yeah, probably so. If something was going wrong at the test site, could, could you get like an audio signal, I assume? I mean, it wouldn't work on the moon, of course, but... Uh, well, I mean, uh, there are cell phones. Uh, we don't, we don't have, I'm not really sure what a self-diagnostic microphone is. Uh, so I know that we don't have any of those on the rover, but one of the, the benefits of our platform, our rover is that you can send us multiple types of, of, of payloads or instrumentation, uh, hardware that we can integrate into the rover. And so if you have one that can be integrated into the rover, then, then yes, we would have one. Okay. Uh, Bill Clausen would like to know, is your rover open source? Can someone design an accessory based on an open spec? I know that our, it, it's, it's a funny story, the, the, the evolution of our rover. Each, everything that's on that rover has been uh, designed, built, and tested by university students. So right now we're on our fourth generation uh, GUI because each summer the students that come in and I ask them to improve the GUI, they object to working on somebody else's GUI and they decide to, uh, decide to start one from scratch. Um, so this last GUI was built on the, um, on the open source ROV. And so, yeah, it, it's definitely something that it's, it's easy to, to, to work on and, and open up to, to other people. Great. And finally, Philip and most of us would like to know where you got that awesome shirt. Oh, I could tell you, but I have to kill you all. I bet. <laughs> Actually, uh, you know, believe it or not, it's, it's an old Navy t uh, shirt. Really? Yeah, I was just walking one day in the mall with my wife and saw that shirt and I just had to have it. Uh, I bet you their website's going to get a lot of searches today. <laughs> I know. You know like, every, I take it to every conference and every conference people haven't tried to buy it off my back. So. Oh, it's great. <laughs> yeah. All right. Does anybody have any other questions for Rodrigo? All right. Well, thanks, Rodrigo. That was very informative. Really appreciate it. Right. Thank you. My email's there on the list on the, on the right. Anybody has any questions or would like to discuss any of the, of the subjects or the questions you posted in further detail, uh, if you'd like to get a copy of the ICD for our rover uh, or any other uh, spec on the, on the test sites we have or on the mineral composition of the basalt from different sources that we have um, analyzed, uh, please send me an email. I'll be, I'll be glad to, to um, work. Oh, just a, a final note. Um, we're a state agency, so we, we do not qualify as a small business for SBIR, SDTR grant purposes. However, we are, um, we do qualify as a research institution. So if anybody has a small business and like to apply for SBIR, SDTR grant, and is looking, you would like to do some analog testing here and, and looking for an RI to team up with, 
Pisces has been a partner up in, in, in multiple SDTR grants as a research institution. Excellent. All right. All right, everyone. Well, see you around the conference. Cheers.